thank you very much for this great introduction. Uh, as you have made notice, yes, I'm really in, uh, interested in aviation and aerospace. And today's talk is about a flying wing and how this could improve the, the fuel efficiency in the future of commercial aviation. So yeah, that's just a little bit about me. As I've already mentioned, I'm studying aerospace engineering at the RWTH Aachen. Besides this, I'm flying air, uh, Z-planes. I'm still doing research on flying wings. And besides this, I have also founded a student group in Aachen who competes at international student competitions in the aviation area. So my whole life basically is everything shaped around aviation more or less. Okay, so for this presentation or for this talk, let's take a look at what aviation in a global sense today means. If you look at this, uh, this map, you see all the, the routes that are offered by airlines today. There are 25,000 airliners out there that transport people from A to B. Around 4 billion people per year fly on around 80 billion kilometers all around the globe on 40 million flights. That means approximately every second somewhere around the globe, an airplane is taking off with 95 people on board. That's a huge lot. But the downside of this is that per year, 35 billion liters of jet fuel are burned. And that's what my talk is about, how we can reduce this fuel consumption to reduce the, the global impact on climate of the aviation. So first we go all the steps back and take a very abstract look on what do we want to do with aviation, with an aircraft, with the full system. And if you look from a very far, far point of view, we don't want to do anything else than taking a person or many persons and transport them from one point on the globe to another point. And this is what we engineers call passenger kilometers. This is how you can compare something like going with your car just one and a half kilometers to another place or flying with 500 other people across the Atlantic. You can reduce this to a passenger kilometer to compare different modes of transportation. Obviously, you can also do this for, for cargo and then it's just called ton kilometers. But today I will focus on passenger kilometers. You can just substitute them with each other or compare them if you have the right numbers for, for your passenger model. Then, as I have mentioned, we want to reduce the fuel consumption. And if you think about fuel consumption and environmental change and everything, you normally talk about something like efficiency. So we first want to define what is efficiency in a, from a very basic point of view. It's just what you have on useful output to your total input. And depending on how you define your useful output, it can also change your whole equation. So if you're defining one of the two, these two parts are wrong, you can get up with the, the wrong numbers. Then let's put in our first equation or what we have defined as our transport work, the passenger kilometer, and then get a function for the efficiency in transport. What's basically just passenger kilometer, we want to transport something or somebody from A to B in relation to the energy we need to do this. If you compare different modes of transportation, you might find in a web something like this. It clearly shows that if you just walk from A to B, it's still the most efficient way to do. But it's maybe not that practical if you want to go to the United States or South Africa or something like, like this, because then would even require swimming, which is far less efficient than walking. So maybe an even worse idea. Then train, obviously, is a very good choice, maybe the best you have. But then what's maybe interesting is that flying is actually more efficient than driving a car. Mostly because uh, more people are in an airplane than a car. So cars are, so to say, just too large if there are only one or two persons in it. Um, if you think that it's maybe better if you want to go to New York or so to take a, a ship across the Atlantic, that's not a good idea. It's very poor, about five times worse than flying to New York. So. You should stay with the, the airlines in this case, maybe. <laughs> or take a sailboat. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> After this introduction, um, or uh, as you have now seen, it's maybe the best idea to take an airplane to go long distance if you have to go then. 
we were focused from now on on the aircraft system. And for this, we, from a further perspective, let's define how an aircraft fulfills this function of transport work of getting passenger kilometers done, so to say. And then basically three main functions of an aircraft is you need thrust to propel your aircraft through the air, you need the lift to stay in the air, and you need some kind of structure to keep everything together, to keep your lift, your payload, and your uh, engines together and provide the safety you need. Then apply our function we had for the efficiency, so useful output, or passenger kilometers defined by the three main functions, divided by the total input. And then we can rewrite this equation to the efficiency of the engine times what is called lift to drag. That's a factor for the aerodynamic efficiency of an aircraft, widely used in industry and basically the key factor if you compare different aircraft concepts. And then the last factor is how much payload you have to your mass structure. This is what applies to most cars. Most cars have a very poor number of passengers compared to the full vehicle weight. So the goal should be to optimize this factor as well. Okay, so that's a pretty, um, at least for me as a maybe too long formula. So let's try to, to make this simpler. Okay, first, the efficiency of the engines. The engines are basically where we separate part of the aircraft. There are many engineers trying to improve them, but they are not directly affecting the aircraft. So it can cancel this out. And also the payload is basically constant. We just define that we want to transport one person or 500 person or whatever number of persons from A to B. So we can simplify the whole equation and focus on these two parts. We want to maximize the aerodynamic efficiency of the aircraft while at the same time reducing the structural weight of it. So it's important to have these two parts together and weight them against each other and optimize the full aircraft system and not only one part of it. Um, besides this, there are another constraints. For example, you want to travel safe. Actually, aircrafts are around 100 times safer than, than a car. For this talk, I'm also fo only focusing on the safe flight characteristics, but there are many other constraints, but to keep it simple, we will use it to this. Okay, as we have now defined that we want to maximize the, the LLVD and reduce the structural rate, we can take a look at today's current conventional aircraft design, identify the different components, and if we look at them, we notice that the only part that really produces the lift we need to fly is the wing, marked in green. So if we want to optimize our function, wouldn't be better to just have the wing. This concept is called the flying wing, and it potentially offers a reduced weight and an improved uh, aerodynamic efficiency. But the downside is that the flight characteristics are more critical than for conventional design. In fact, the only flying wing that was ever produced in, in larger numbers, the B2 bomber, can only fly with a huge computer system that stabilizes it and also is by far the most expensive aircraft ever built. So not the best, best solution if you want ticket prices that are comparable to a normal aircraft. Okay. The, this solution to this problem of the critical flight characteristics, that was a project I did for, for Jürgen Forsch and also for the Intel ISAF, and this focused on improving this. And for this, I looked far back in history to 1930s. There are two German brothers, Horton. They also built model aircrafts, flew sailplanes, and they were also interested by flying wings. And they actually found a solution for this problem of instable flight characters, and it's called belt shaped lift distribution. So what does lift distribution mean? If you look from the front or from the back at, at a wing, um, you see how the lift is distributed along the span. Normally it's called elliptical lift distribution. This offers the best, um, the highest lift for the lowest drag. So basically every aircraft uses this concept. But for my project, I used the so-called belt shaped lift distribution. You can see in the lower part. And what does it do for the efficiency? With this lift distribution, the outer wing area basically acts like the horizontal tailplane on a conventional aircraft and therefore provides the pitch stability we need to, to keep a steady flight. While the so-called sweep back, you see on basically every aircraft already today, provides direction stability 
because if you're drawing a little bit in one direction, the force on the, the one side gets larger and you have a force to, to go back in a, a straight way. To prove this practical, I simulated and designed an aircraft. I built it and then flew it as a model aircraft and conducted many tests with it. I have brought for you a short video of a so-called stall test. That is, if you're going slower and slower, at one point the flow will separate and the aircraft yeah, kind of stops uh, flying and somehow needs to recover its energy. And the best thing of it's just taking the nose down and not entering spin. So this test shows that the aircraft is stable and not entering spin. Video. Okay. Okay, as we have now analyzed uh, the flight stability <laughs> and also seen that we can reduce the the structural mass and also reduce the track because we don't have any more the, the track of the, the tail surface and the fuselage. We can mark that we have the structural rate reduced, the parasitic track reduced, and we have safe flight characteristics. But the last point you may remember from the first formula is the so-called induced track. That's the track you have to basically pay to get a lift from the wing. And if you look at the equation for, for the induced track, you may notice that it's a function of the wingspan. Everything else is basically constant because you need a constant lift. And if you're making the wingspan much larger, you're largely reducing your induced drag. You can see this on sailplanes. They're <coughs> depending on a very good aerodynamic efficiency and that's why they have that large wingspans. But why not all airplanes have a that high wingspan? The problem is in the mechanical problems of a larger ring. In fact, of the bending moment, bending moment is defined by the force times the distance from where this force acts. And if you see, if you have a large ring span, you have a large distance, means that you have a high bending moment and therefore need a very heavy structure to compensate these forces, this bending moment. And this, as you may uh, recall, we want to optimize our aerodynamic efficiency but don't want to increase our structural mass. So this would be a, a too poor idea to just increase the ring span too much. But if you look at the two lift distributions, you may notice that the lift is moved a little bit inwards so that the, the distance between the, the center part and where the lift force acts is smaller and therefore your bending moment is reduced which means that you can either increase your ring span or you can re reduce your structural rate. And this also compensates the effect that the elliptical lift distribution is a little bit poorer performing than the, the bell-shaped lift distribution is a little bit poorer performing than the bell-shaped. But what you're saving in structural mass compensates this and you get a ring that's approximately 20% more efficient than another a conventional ring. And with this, we have basically found a solution for all uh, the requirements we have set. And in result, we can get up to 30% in reduction of fuel consumption, what means that we could save up to 100 billion liters of jet fuel per year for uh, commercial air transport, what is, is a lot. Yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. The flying wing may be a, a solution, but there are many other solutions out there like electric flying, other wing, wing concepts. And I want you to kind of inspire that you just keep to be curious. And if you find something, analyze it. Just try to, to find formulas you can understand, reduce us to them, and then see if it works or not. Try to connect with other people, normally at a very they like to help you and if you're curious, you will get help. Thank you.